And here we go. The North Pacific pulses. I am Mark Sponsor and welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, September 22nd. Storm Surf. Waves, weather, buoys, altimetry, snow, temperatures, El Nino, weather analysis, essential data for outdoor people, all the time, no hype. If you enjoy the video, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Click the Storm Surf icon down the lower right-hand corner of your screen. And if you have a question or comment, write it up down below. We'd be happy to answer it. And also, if you'd like to make a small contribution to the cause, you may hit the super thanks button down below. The heart with the dollar sign in it. With that, I'd like to thank the folks that donated last week. Our regular cast of donators, our predicament, Tim Caston, Coach Nate, Evolution Moto. Thank you guys so much. And then uh, some not new contributors, but I've seen them here a few times, and I do appreciate it. Don Mandatron. Matt Graves, a new one, Carmela Buscemi, Clay Goose, and Ash Winsody. Thank you all so much. With that, let's get to work. We'll start off by taking a quick look at significant wave heights across the entire planet. We'll start in the North Pacific, since that's the title of the video, What's Going On Here? Yes, there is a gale with 24-foot seas in the northwestern Gulf of Alaska, pushing off to the east, offering hope. Actually, seas were higher when it was back to the over by the dateline. We'll get all, into all that in a minute. But certainly, suggesting swell is on the way for Hawaii and California. Uh, looking over at the Indian Ocean, we have a gale there with 28-foot seas south of Madagascar. Another one under South Australia with, oh, 34-foot seas. The South Pacific, quiet as it's been for a while. The South Atlantic, a little gale down here with 24-foot or so seas. And the North Atlantic, there actually is some activity. Fetch blowing here along the northeast coast, targeting the northeastern United States, and things are going to actually start looking better there as we get deeper into the week. So a bit of activity everywhere. But before we get into all that, we're going to start by looking at current conditions in our home base area. That would be California, Hawaii area. We're looking at buoys, uh, the Point Reyes buoy, 029 off of Northern California. And as you all pretty much know, there isn't a whole lot going on, but there has been some fun wind swell. So we're looking here at a graph of all the energy that's hit hitting the buoy all the way up from 33.3 second period, really long period energy, all the way down to five second period, just pure wind chop. This is the height in feet of the energy in each of those period bands. You see the bulk of the energy here right about nine seconds. That's all pure wind swell. A little tiny hint of something out here at 20 seconds, but completely buried in what's ever happening here. Use the algorithm to uh, tease out the primary swell, main swell, five feet at 9.3 seconds from 524 degrees. That would theoretically make 4.6 foot surf. I think waves are Eh, waist to chest high, something like that, so a bit overstated, and no meaningful secondary swell. Then we go to Southern California, the Point Loma South Buoy 191. This is off of San Diego, but a good proxy for everything that's moving into the Southern California area. And you see the Channel Islands blocking all the wind swell, and otherwise really nothing. There isn't even a single period band with a half a foot of swell, so... Things are definitely going slow for the moment. And then we go look at the North Shore of Hawaii, Buoy 106, the Waimea Bay Buoy, and the same, if not worse, kind of profile, just nothing happening at all. We discussed a lot about this last week in the What's Going On With The Atmosphere Part 2 series, and this bit of where there's no momentum in the atmosphere, and that still appears to be the case somewhat for the moment, but with the change as seasons happening, there is definitely momentum starting to happen in the North Pacific, as one would expect. Um, it's actually a little bit late this year, and this gets into the dynamics of La Nina and El Nino and where we've been and where we're going. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get deeper into this forecast, but we're not going to go do the super deep dive like last week. So let's do a real quick review. We're going to go the whole way around the planet real quick. We're just going to look at what has happened in each of the specific oceans over the past week. We'll start in the South Pacific. Here's our main area, Chile, New Zealand, uh, Antarctica down here, the Ross Ice Shelf in this area. You get the general idea. We're looking for seas 
28 feet or higher anywhere in in the greater south pacific and we're into already wednesday thursday we, we started the last sunday here and we're just there's really the the point of this is there's literally nothing that has happened up to this point in the south pacific so no swell is in the water no swell on the way to hawaii for, on the south shores or southern california or south facing shores in northern california but then we go to the north pacific we're back at sunday the 15th of september not a whole lot going on, but we do see a little gale try to organize here over the dateline, but it quickly gets shunted off to the north. And whatever fetch you saw there, 28 foot seas, it was all pretty much encased in uh, the Bering Sea. Nothing happened. But then as we get into Saturday, so just 24 hours ago, this gale spun up off the Creel Islands with, was that, 28.8 foot seas. These are the highest seas over this entire domain. And that continued to push east into midday Saturday with 30 foot seas holding, pushing over the dateline, and then pushing over into the, I'll call it the far northwestern Gulf with 25 foot seas. That was into Sunday. That's a, as of right now. And now seas down at 24 feet, suggesting that there is swell on the way for Hawaii and into California. How big is the question? Let me go examine the North Atlantic. Again, we're going back a week ago, the 15th of September. We'll put this in motion. Yes, there was a storm targeting Iceland and certain sideband energy into Ireland and maybe the UK. Um, after that, the main area that everyone thought would be on fire right now, the, uh, the main development region in the North Atlantic, quiet as a mouse the whole way through into Thursday and Friday. Now you see this fetch starting to develop on Friday off the northeast coast, generating some seas in the eh, 12 foot range, something like that, definitely making surf up into the northeast coast. Uh, we're going to keep our eyes on this as we get into the forecast because a much more interesting pattern is forecast. Then we go to the South Atlantic. Also keep your eyes on the ice here. Uh, every three days, you get new satellite data and you'll you'll notice the ice sheet changing some. Now there was a gale that pushed under South Africa on Monday with what is that 36 foot seas, but all aimed off to the east and southeast. Yes, some swell likely is or was pushing north up into South Africa, but whatever that was, it's pretty much gone. And after that, a fairly quiet pattern is in play up till just about now when things are starting to get interesting. And then finally, we go take a look at the Indian Ocean. Pretty calm pattern a week ago. That was the 15th of September. We'll just put this into motion. You see a bit of energy push under Africa, another one under South Australia with uh, 34 foot seas and aimed well off to the northeast, certainly targeting uh, oh, the area down here into uh, Tasmania. And then that system faded out on Thursday. Another system organized on Saturday with, let's go back one frame there. I think it was 40, maybe 40 foot seas, 38.7, sorry, 39. And that was about as high as it got. Swell from that impacting that area now as we speak with a little bit more trying to organize right behind that and some more off in the Southwestern Indian Ocean. So what's the forecast for the North Pacific? We're gonna start there. We do our deep dive there because it is the season that is our home base. We're gonna start by looking at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales. And when those gales form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough, a dip in the jet, just like we see right there. We know there are some seas of some sort building this area. The winds there, one, two, three, that's 160 knot winds. These winds, Digging to the south helped create a counterclockwise flow aloft and down at the ocean surface. That's the hallmark of low pressure. And of course, low pressure, if it's strong enough, gets traction on the ocean surface, generates seas. Seas as they radiate away from the fetch area, the shorter period elements decay off, exposing swell. And of course, swell and hit your beach creates surf. So we have a well configured, a consolidated jet stream pushing across the North Pacific down at about 45 south with a trough, and we already know there is some seas being generated by low pressure supported by this trough. So 
good foundation in the upper atmosphere for doing what we want. As we get into Monday, that trough continues into the, the Gulf. I'll call it more like the Northern Gulf. Even into Tuesday, it's there and continuing pushing into Vancouver Island, even as late as Wednesday, that would be the 25th of September. After that, the jet sort of backs off a little bit, but you see a steady bit of winds pushing into the Vancouver Island area and more wind energy starting to build as we get off Japan into Friday the 27th. And then another trough starts organizing here as we get into Saturday, the 28th of September, and pushing off to the east, now not completely consolidated, looking a little bit better as we get into Sunday. And there we are a week out, Gulf of Alaska looking like it is quite capable of supporting a gale. So let's see if we can confirm our suspicions. We're going to start by looking at surface level pressure, surface level winds as of today, Sunday, the 27th, 22nd of September. Sure enough, we have a gale with 35 to 40 knot uh, west winds in the far northwestern Gulf of Alaska, plowing its way through the Gulf as we get into Monday and slowly fading out by later Monday. And that's the end of that. Then things, another low pressure now, it's interesting, this low pressure 24 hours ago was actually forecast to get really strong, uh, now not looking quite as much. Yes, 40 knot winds, almost 45 knots, but pretty much already impacting uh, British Columbia as we get into Thursday and early Friday, the 27th of September. Probably not a whole lot going to happen there in terms of supporting uh, swell production, except locally and maybe in the Pacific Northwest. Another gale tries to get organized as we get into Saturday, just east of the dateline. We know there's something there. And Sunday, it winds up too up here in the northern Gulf with, well, 45 knot winds aimed well to the, I'll say, east down to the southeast. So offering potential there. Here we are 180 hours out and another gale building over the dateline. So it seems like we have turned the corner and at least the North Pacific is starting to come online. So what are the effects of those winds on the ocean surface? Well, we're looking at the significant wave heights. This is driven by the GFS wind model. This indicates uh, how well those winds are actually getting purchased on the ocean surface in terms of generating seas. We have seas of 24.7 feet uh, in the northwestern Gulf of Alaska. As we move forward, those seas by Monday continue in the eh, 23 foot range, then start fading out by there. And by Tuesday morning, that gale is all but gone. Now we know there are some more systems behind there. Here comes the first system supposedly winding up off of Vancouver Island on late Thursday. But honestly, it's all inland before the winds get purchased on the ocean surface. Another one follows up right behind that in the northern Gulf. It too looks to be doing the same thing. Whoop, there we are, 180 hours out. And another one trying to get traction off by the dateline, producing 22 or three foot seas, but mostly all aimed off to the, that'd be the Southwest. So the models have been going back and forth. At one point, this system was forecast with 40 plus foot seas over here in the far West Pacific. Now, something less is forecast. Regardless, the North Pacific at least is trying. Now we go to the South Pacific and what's even more interesting, we'll just sort of zoom through this. You see there's a gale, we'll just go back here real quick. Tasman Sea, 30, what is that? 33 put, foot seas or so, not really aimed well to the Northeast, but then the gale tries to get exposure under New Zealand on Tuesday the 24th and a little bit of a side gale forms off of that building 31 foot seas over a tiny area Wednesday morning, the 25th of September, aimed well off to the Northeast. This would be great for Hawaii, good for Tahiti, and probably some swell should result for the U.S. West Coast as well. Stronger gale behind it with seas in the 40 foot range, but again, it's falling Southeast. If the gale isn't pushing Northeast up towards wherever you live or wherever your beach is, then the odds of swell from that resulting uh, greatly diminish. You're getting sideband energy at best, and you get like maybe a third or a quarter of the swell size that one would normally expect. After that, things looking to be fading in the South Pacific. No big surprise, it is that time of the year. And we go to the North Atlantic. 
uh, U.S. West Coast, I mean, U.S. East Coast, Florida, Outer Banks, Cape Hatteras, Long Island, New York, New Jersey, and that area, and then Europe over on this side of the chart. Now, there is Fetch producing, eh, what is that, 17, not, that's 17 foot seas up there. It's probably about 15 foot seas aimed at, mainly from Cape Hatteras northward, building some to maybe uh, 15 feet as we get into Monday. That system fades out, but a secondary gale is forecast behind that with 18 foot seas spreading over the whole U.S. East Coast a bit better. That fades out as we get into Thursday. Now, here's the big story. The models have been consistently, I'll go back here, it starts on right about there. On Tuesday, this a tropical system, I mean, it was a week or a week and a half ago the models were hinting at some sort of a tropical system falling uh, south of Cuba. Uh, hard to believe it, but it kind of looks like it's really going to happen now. With you, you see the seas in the 29-foot range pushing up into the Gulf of Mexico as we get into Wednesday and pushing north harder. That 40-foot seas, this would be some sort of at least a hurricane, theoretically 50-foot seas. I think that's way overhyped. Targeting uh, the Panhandle area, the Big Bend of Florida, and moving right on shore come Thursday night, late Thursday afternoon. We'll see if that really materializes. But if, if you're anywhere in, we'll say, from Tampa Bay over to New Orleans, this certainly bears watching. Keep your eyes on it. Another system forecast out here off the Cape Verde Islands. That pushing off to the west-northwest. We'll see what happens of that. Not expecting a whole lot. And then another system forming off the northeast coast. This morning's run of the model had this broad and strong, but again, it's about a week out. We'll see what really happens, but certainly potential for surf spraying over this entire area here. Not And this guy, we're not even talking about it. Well, one, he's way too far away to really have any major impact. This is much broader and much more local. So we'll see how this all plays out, but certainly U.S. East Coast looks like it has the potential for surf as well. Quick check on the South Atlantic. Right now, a relatively placid pattern. Here comes another one of these gales with 26-foot seas pushing east under South Africa. Probably good enough to push some swell up that way. In fact, you can actually kind of see it here. Raw sea energy pushing up towards uh, uh, South Africa. Let's see what else pops up here as we get into this. I thought there was one more on the charts. I might have been mistaken. There's Sure enough, there it is, but it's east uh, uh, yeah, east of South Africa, probably not going to do a whole lot for swell production if it does form seas building to 42 feet, pushing off into the greater Indian Ocean. And then finally, the Indian Ocean view. We'll go into this right now. Little gale with 23-foot seas, good for 13 per, per, uh, second period swell. In the southwest Indian Ocean, you can see a swell front pushing up towards Bali and uh, Western Australia. Another gale building way to the south, but not really doing a whole lot. Inconsequential. And then another system trying to develop as we get into Sunday, where again, we're almost a week out with 23, 24 foot seas targeting South Australia. And then here comes the theoretically stronger storm forecast. Again, it's a week out on the models. I wouldn't believe it, but it's something worth keeping in mind, especially how the season is winding down now. Wind forecast for California right there in the Hawaiian Islands there, San Francisco there, Point Conception there, uh, San Diego down around here, there's the border. Um, high pressure in control. 1026 millibar high, producing a gradient and north winds at 20 knots off of Cape Mendocino, generating wind swell that's pushing into the coast. You know, waves north of uh, Point Conception, you know, waist high, maybe chest high on the peak sort of thing. Rideable surf, and notice a bit of a, a uh, this eddy flow. So there's low pressure inland, high pressure here. You get this sort of backwards flow, likely either calm winds or light south flow along the coast. That's the way it was today. We get into Monday. Hawaiian Islands, notice trades just light, 15 knots. The gradient continues, 25 knots, maybe even building a little relative to California, increasing the likelihood for surf on Monday. So we get into Tuesday, the whole gradient completely collapses. A light wind flow along the U.S. along the California coast trades 10-15 knots, pretty light for uh, California. Again, a light flow 
on Wednesday, not doing a whole lot. Trades light for the Hawaiian Islands. So we get into Thursday, here comes that low pressure system pushing into Vancouver with yeah, 45 knot winds. Now this was, you know, this is the 12 Z run of the model. The wave model is the 18 Z. Suspect this is a bit overstated. Anyway, you see Northwest winds building uh, 20 knots along North California, 15 knots into Central California Thursday afternoon. Trades light for the Hawaiian Islands. Friday, here comes the next batch of a gradient, clearing high pressure moving in behind the low. Northwest winds, let's see where they go to. 30 to 35 knots on Saturday, no trades light for the Hawaiian Islands. By Sunday, I think it builds even a little bit more. Now 30 knots, next low building in the Gulf of Alaska, but trades 10 knots for the Hawaiian Islands. Light winds for most of North and uh, Central California, again, more wind swell. So at least wind swell for the weekend will push this out, there we go, to 180 hours. And all in all, not a horrible pattern, wind swell at least, but we really, I'd like to see this actually materialize. At least you could get some good north swell, but I don't know if that's going to happen. Backpackers forecast for the p intersection of the Pacific Crest Trail in Tioga Pass Road up there over on the east side of, on the crest of the Sierra, uh, up by Tuolumne Meadows area. Elevation at that intersection, 8,700 feet. Temperatures there, well, starting today, 50 to 55 degrees building to 55 to 60 degrees as we get later into the coming work week and next weekend. Actually, quite pleasant temperatures indeed. No sign of anything pretty cold. You see the freeze line here at 12,500 feet and that completely disappearing as we get later in the week. Surf forecast. We'll start at Ocean Beach. These are surf heights. Here's your wind swell in the four foot range. You see as we get into Wednesday, ground swell actually hitting surf heights in the six to six and a half foot range. You're talking one, maybe two foot overhead if we're lucky. That's slowly fading out. And then it looks like a bunch of wind swell. Now these are, this is more over outer waters. You won't see that high of a surf. Uh, near the coast on Saturday, Sunday, as that gradient sets up, but certainly wind swell. Let's go look at, at swell sizes here. Here's our main swell, four and a half to almost five feet at 13 seconds on Wednesday, fading on Thursday. Then here comes a bunch of winds and wind swell, and then you have seven feet at 10 seconds sort of thing and fading from there. So wind swell for sure. We go down to Southern California, the Channel Islands really putting a kibosh on whatever Northwest swells putting, pulling in north of Point Conception. Surf heights, according to this, pretty much non-existent. And even with the raging Northwest wind swell, only one foot surf heights down at Dana Point, something like that. Swell size is less than a foot at nine seconds, not, not even a hint of any of the Northwest swell pulling in on Wednesday or Thursday. I think that's a little bit grossly overstated. I think at select locations, there will be waist high surf. Then as you get further into the work week as the, the next set of wind swell builds up 8.8 feet at 12 seconds or so, that might also be a bit understated. Then we go to the North shore of Oahu, surf heights, 6.7 feet. This would be late Tuesday, and then the swell. This is that swell from the Gulf of Alaska reaching the islands first, as it always does. Then slowly trickling, trickling down through Thursday into maybe even early Friday, then pretty much out. Swell heights, 4.5 feet at 14 to almost 15 seconds uh, late on Tuesday. Now, now that's pretty much under cover of darkness. You'll get the leading edge of the swell somewhere into around here. So maybe four foot surf right at sunset. And then you pick it up on Wednesday morning uh, at, you know, in the uh, four foot range and fading down from there. But some sort of rideable surf, potentially the whole way into eh, Friday morning is probably pushing a little bit, but in that general area. And we take a quick look. Let's jump over to South Africa, Jeffreys Bay. Surf height supposedly nine feet, but looks like a whole bunch of uh, onshore wind there. But as we get into midweek, 12-foot surf heights, again, pretty windy, but offshore. And then as we get into the weekend, 20-foot surf and piles of wind, 30-knot winds. Okay, let's go take a look at the actual swell heights. Right now, 6 feet at 13 seconds. Then the next pulse coming in about 8 feet at 15 seconds. And then 
The next pulse after that, uh, a, week, a week out on the weekend, 17 feet, 11 to 12 seconds. Probably pretty raw indeed, but probably some good surf at protected spots. Quick look at Bali. Surf heights in the, we'll say, five and a half to six and a half foot range for Monday and Tuesday fading down. Another pulse coming in on Friday in the seven foot range fading down from there and back up. Uh, swell heights, five feet at 12 to 13 seconds. And then again, five feet at 15 seconds of, on Friday. And then again, another little pulse of five feet at 13 seconds towards Sunday and Monday. If one is to believe the models regard, regarding the tropical system in the Gulf of Mexico, well, we're going to pull up Pensacola here this time of year. Normally pretty quiet, but surf heights theoretically to 24 feet. <laughs> but you also see winds blowing at 35 to 40 knots, and this is probably a bit understated. Swell heights, 15 feet at 15.4 feet at 15.7 uh, seconds on Thursday uh, in the afternoon, right before sunset as the storm moves on shore. On shore. Certainly probably won't be rideable, but uh, if you have property there, certainly keep your eye on this and take the necessary precautions. Then we go and take a quick look at Cape Hatteras Lighthouse because there is actually surf. There's been a pretty good run of, of you know, some sort of east to northeast swell. Surf heights up to six feet, theoretically, later Monday into Tuesday, fading to four feet again up to six feet as we get into Thursday, and then fading down from there and winds picking up as we get into Saturday and Sunday with a decreasing surf size. Swell size is five feet at 11 seconds. That's pretty good. Can't argue with that and then again about four and a half feet at 13 seconds if all the this goes down as expected a good run of surf for the mid-atlantic coast if you believe the models and with that let's go take a look long term what's going on with the two major weather oscillation oscillations that affect uh, swell production and weather production long term the mjo the madden julian oscillation and the El Nino Southern Oscillation, and so. We're gonna start with the MJO, the Madden-Julian Oscillation discussion first. There are two phases to the MJO, the active phase and the inactive phase. The active phase is like a low pressure system. The inactive phase is like a high pressure system. They rotate opposite each other around the planet on the equator from west to east, one on one side of the planet, the other on the other side of the planet. The active phase of the MJO is our friend. It being like a low pressure system, it sucks warm, moist air from the ocean surface up into the atmosphere. That is effectively energy that when it gets tapped by the jet stream, strengthens the jet stream, consolidates it, helps it or makes it more effective at carving out troughs and therefore supporting storms in the upper levels of the atmosphere. And of course, that affects us down in the lower levels. Uh, the inactive phase does the exact opposite. It's like a high pressure system producing sinking air that steals energy from the jet stream. The jet stream splits, becomes weak, supports high pressure at the ocean surface. And yes, high pressure is good for supporting wind swell development. It is not good for producing, let's say, hurricanes, storms, uh, precipitation, and big winter storms in the eh, either in the southern oceans or the northern oceans. All right, so we're looking for signs of the active phase of the MJO. We're looking at data from the TAO buoy array, a series of buoys strung across the equator used for monitoring El Nino, but there are wind sensors on those buoys. They are not collecting hourly wind, but you can derive uh, average winds from that data, and that gives you a sense of whether the MJO is in the active or inactive phase. High pressure at the ocean surface associated with the inactive phase of the MJO enhances trades because trade winds are driven by high pressure. The active phase of the MJO produces weaker trades or out and out changes the trade directions and makes them westerly. That is our friend. So we're just looking at the arrows here. This is the East Pacific here, West Pacific here. There's the equator. We're looking at the arrows, pretty strong trades out of the east in the east Pacific. This is the east Pacific. Central Pacific, moderately strong out of the east. All this sort of looks like the inactive phase, the MJO. Get over into the far west Pacific, that's New Guinea there, the date line's right there. Um, you see winds pretty strong out of the east, but not super strong. But it is not the actual wind speeds that matter. 
It is the anomaly, the difference from normal for this time of year. It's all relative to what else is going on in the atmosphere. These little arrows show that they have a, what is it, a 30-year running climatologic average uh, that says here's what the average winds are on this day in this location for the past 30 years. You average it out, and then you take today's winds and compare it to that. You see, well, looks like the winds are pretty much about normal average. Over the, the Central Pacific, pretty much the same thing, and maybe just slightly stronger out of the east over the West Pacific. So neither a strong active or inactive phase is suggested from this data, but let's go look at the forecast for two weeks out. Here is zonal wind anomalies. There you go, 850 millibar zonal wind anomalies. These are wind speeds, average wind speeds, are they stronger out of the east or stronger out of the west than normal? Again, that 30-year climatological average we're talking about. That helps us tease out whether we're in the active or inactive phase, but also talks to the El Nino situation as well. So let's just pull this down here. There we go. All right. So, oops, one more click. There we go. Dateline. This is for the whole planet, though. The dateline runs right up the middle. The blues are easterly anomalies, loosely associated with the inactive phase of the AMJO. Oranges and reds, active phase of the MJO. So you can see going back here in late August, looked like east anomalies running from west to east across our planet there. And now you see westerly anomalies working their way across the Pacific. But there's this hole right here in the dateline. And we're going to get into talking about this. But this certainly looks like the active phase of the MJO. But right on the dateline, it looks like there's some sort of high pressure there that's really cutting the heart out of the active phase of the MJO, and that would be our La Nina pattern. We'll get into that on how all that works in a minute. But then, as you see, as you get later into September and October, looks like another inactive phase of the MJO sets up with strong easterly anomalies. So if there was a window for swell production, it would be right about where we are now. So in the active phase of the MJO, we said before you have rising air, warm moist air lifting aloft. Eventually that's gonna hit cold air of the stratosphere, condense into clouds. That's, and the more clouds you have, you get what they call negative anomalies, these blues. Negative outgoing long wave radiation. If the sunlight's coming in through the atmosphere, hits the ocean, on its way back out, if there's a lot of clouds, that sunlight gets diffused and diffracted. And from that, you can sort of get an estimate of what's going on MJO-wise. So right now, these blue anomalies, oh, and let's get organized here. The equator right there, dateline right there, uh, South America, Central America, Hawaii, New Guinea there, Australia, you get the idea. The main area we're interested is on the equator, five degrees north and south of the equator from 125 east. That's as far west in the Pacific as you can get, out to about 170 west. I'll call it the Kelvin wave generation area, but that's where if you have a developing El Nino or a strong active phase of the MGO, this is the area, one, where it's going to get traction on the ocean surface and do things, and two, where it's going to be best at taking warm, moist air and pumping it up into the upper atmosphere. So right now, the blues suggest some sort of a weak active phase of the MGO. This is a statistic model, the CA model. But five days from now, that active phase disappears. And oh, 10 days from now, weak active phase and a building active phase two weeks from now. So that's pretty, or building inactive phase, I'm sorry, two weeks from now. So that's pretty much similar to what we saw in the previous model. Now that's a statistic model. Here is the dynamic model. This is the GEFS model. The GFS model, the same sort of uh, a model that's used to run the wave models, drive winds into the wave model. Same sort of pattern, weak active phase fading, and then a stronger inactive phase building behind that about two weeks out. Phase diagrams for those two models, uh, kind of hard to read these, but I'll, I'll help you there. This is the statistic model. This is the dynamic model. How do you read this? The MJO moves from west to east, from the Indian Ocean to the Maritime Continent, the West Pacific to the East Pacific, over Africa, back over the Indian Ocean, round, round she goes, oh, East Pacific, under the United States, to Africa, then to the Indian Ocean. The heavy dot is where the active phase is today, so in the West Pacific, but the further, the closer that dot is to this circle, the weaker it is, so a very weak active phase right now. The forecast, one, two different three tracks, all of them having it over Africa, two of them suggest very exceedingly weak, 
one suggests moderately, we'll say moderate strength. The dynamic model suggests the same sort of pattern, uh, moderately strong active phase of the MJO over the over Africa about a week from now, and then collapsing as it moves to the Indian Ocean. Now, there are a whole bunch of other models here. You can see, you saw where I just clicked the link on the page. You can go through all these. Some of them go out a month. You see here, uh, the, the European model has the active phase returning to the West Pacific or close to the West Pacific a month from now, so late in October. Uh, the Canadian model, uh, it's, it's only a two-week model. Let's see what else we have. The uh, BOM model, that's uh, um, Bureau, Bureau of Meteorology in Australia, suggesting something noodling around. So, you know, I don't believe a model two weeks out, much less a month. But you can go explore this and get some idea of what the forecast is. Next up, the CFS model going out a month. Past performance down here, the forecast down here, the MJO, the active phase, is the solid black contour, so you can see, oh, and the dateline runs right up the middle. Kelvin wave generation area starts about 125 B, so right here. We had an active phase here back in July, didn't really do a whole lot. We've been plagued by an inactive phase for a while now. So, And then here we are. Here is our current active phase of the MJO. There's your westerly anomalies associated with the active phase. And notice as it gets near the dateline, easterly anomalies persisted. And then here's the forecast, building active phase, but for the most part, east of the dateline, and that doesn't do a whole lot to support storm formation in the Pacific once you're east of the dateline. Now, if it was deeper in winter and you saw this, I'd go, oh, this looks like a rain event coming into California. Um, so wherever, now this, remember, this is just on the equator, but north and south of the equator. So if your equator's here and you're, and you're going north or south, wherever this is on the axis there, that's where you would expect weather to be. So this it's too early in the year, but otherwise I'd say rain for California, but maybe a pretty strong weather event pushing into the Pacific Northwest the next couple of weeks. We'll see. I mean, that's just kind of a reach. Anyway, you see here's the inactive phase and easterly anomalies taking over from late September the whole way through till about mid-October, uh, decreasing odds for surf production then. So this is our window right here according to this model. And then if we don't believe a model going out two weeks, why would we believe a model going out four months? Well, it's fun to look at just the same. And so we're doing that. The CFS model going out three months, all right? Now, past performance is down here, and you can kind of tease out there was an active phase in July and August. You can kind of tease out an inactive phase in August into early September. Here's our current active phase. The forecast starts here. So there was our westerly anomalies. But as we got to the dateline, there's the dateline, kind of faded out. But starting tomorrow, uh, let's say the 23rd of September, westerly anomalies building east of the dateline, pushing south of California. California's at 120. And here comes our next big inactive phase of the MJO. Now, this is likely going to push and feed. This is fuel for La Nina. It's high pressure of the inactive phase of the MJO syncing up with high pressure of the La Nina pattern, doing nothing to support surf production. The net result, lots of easterly anomalies until you get into late October. And then supposedly the active phase of the MJO, it looks like is gonna set up. And after that, it takes over and holds control of the Pacific the whole way from then and beyond. I'll believe it when it happens, but it sure, certainly seems like a good tease. Let's overlay the MJO and see if we're actually right. Here's our current, sure enough, solid uh, contour active phase of the MJO. Forecast holding into about oh, September 30th. Pretty strong inactive phase starting uh, September 25th, let's say, the whole way through till about October 18th, something like that. So that's your dead zone. Then after that, pretty good. I mean, this model has been forecasting this active phase for a long time now. We'll see whether it happens starting about mid-October, the whole way into almost Thanksgiving. And then even after that, with the inactive phase, westerly anomalies are at least a neutral pattern forecast. So this is effectively a, well, you see one inactive phase there in June another one in August, maybe a three-pulse inactive phase La Nina, where our last El Nino 
was a 10 active phase La Nina. I guess you could, uh, I mean, El Nino. So I guess you could, theoretically, I've never tried doing this, but you could count the number of active and inactive phases and see how they sort of compare up. Uh, the El Nino is basically the preponderance of the active phase of the MJO in the Pacific. La Nina is a preponderance of the inactive phase of the MJO. And the stronger the El Nino or La Nina is, the more and stronger the active phases or inactive phases are associated with each, each one respectively. All right, so with all that said, let's go look at the low pass filter. This is the El Nino La Nina indicator ultimately. This actually is providing good news. Not a whole lot different from what we've been seeing, but solid contour, the low pressure bias. This is the El Nino signal. It is over, well, it's like about 90 east, so that's in the Indian Ocean. So this is the La Nina S, uh, component of, uh, uh, of the ENSO cycle with low pressure over the Indian Ocean. And here, the dotted contour, this is your high pressure bias. You see, it, there isn't even, quote unquote, a high pressure bias signal in the Pacific. It hasn't been since August 5th, and it's not supposed to return till about October 20th. And even then, just pretty weak barely one contour. This is not a strong um, La Nina at all. Um, so that's good news. This forecast really hasn't changed. It hasn't changed for weeks and weeks, suggesting our La Nina week, maybe this last push here of the inactive phase of the MJO in October will be it. I think that's wishful thinking, but we'll see. The model isn't making me too concerned that we have some major La Nina event underway. All right, so let's go take a look down into the ocean, all right? That's really what, that's the starting place for uh, El Nino La Nina is, is the balance of warm water in the Pacific on the equator, only five degrees north and south of the equator. This is actually even more conservative, two degrees south to two degrees north. So uh, what's that, four degrees, that's 240 nautical miles uh, from the north of the equator to south of the equator. The, the, uh, but this is for what uh, this is the whole way across the Pacific from 90 west the whole way to 135 east. So good stretch ocean. When the balance of warm water is in the West Pacific, anomaly wise, that is La Nina. That means trades are blowing stronger than normal from east to west, taking warm water and piling it all up in the West Pacific. During El Nino, or the uh, inact or the active phase of the MJO trades weaken, allowing warm water to start sloshing to the east. If you have El Nino, the balance of warm water moves from here over to off of Ecuador and the Galapagos, and wherever the warm water is north and south of that, that's where your precipitation access is, and that's where the, your center of storm formation is. So as of right now, 30 degree isotherm. Pretty holding steady. It actually wasn't even on the chart uh, a couple of weeks ago, so it's holding about 170 east. The 29 degree isotherm holding steady at 180, the date line. 28 degree isotherm unchanged at 170 west. The 24 degree isotherm, the whole way across the Pacific, that's good because at one point it was like cutting off here at like 130 or, one, or 120 west. So all in all, yes, looks like La Nina, but not horribly bad. Let's go look at the anomalies. This is really what matters. The difference from normal. Now, the one big X on this chart. First off, let's go like there. These are the anchor lines. The Xs are the sensors on those buoys. You can see them here, 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 and here, but there are no sensors in this area. So the model is just making up stuff to fill in the gaps. Certainly, well, with the, the sensors right here, they're hitting a pocket of minus five degree anomalies. That's pretty cold water. But whether it's erupting to the surface out here near the date line or possibly over in this area, this model cannot tell. So I'm just going to blow past it. There is another model here. And this model uses satellite data to try to infer where subsurface cold temperatures are. You see this has a much better handle on thing. There's our cold water erupting in the east with pockets of warm water interspersed. But this is, and the thermocline 
sits right along here. This is pretty much the classic La Nina pattern. Warm temperatures that were here are warm anomalies. They've even evaporated. Warm water all in the west, cold water in the east. Pretty typical La Nina pattern as of right now. But as we get into this, we're going to see some other data that suggests that, well, it might be doing it in the ocean, but I don't think it's doing it in the atmosphere just yet. Here are the sea level anomalies. This is the satellite data used to build that previous chart. This is not temperatures. This is the height of the ocean surface, all right? Your Earth is a sphere. You have waves and wind waves and tides all uh, 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 affecting the sphere or the height of the ocean. But if you strip out the waves, the wind waves, you strip out the tides, and you know what an absolute perfect sphere of the Earth should be, then you'll see that there are these deviations over the oceans. And why would there be deviations? Well, if you have cold water at depth, cold water contracts. When you do that, you're going to get the ocean displaced down some, like here, resulting in minus 15 centimeter anomalies. This is the equator here. This is the date line here. This is Chile, Peru. That's the Galapagos right there, Ecuador there. Central America up into the U.S., Hawaii there, Dateline there, New Guinea there, okay? Again, only five degrees north and south of the equator what's matter. But what you see is negative anomalies from the Dateline the whole way into Ecuador, suggesting lots of cool water, though the bulk of it is out here and not so close to the coast. Would this possibly be like a Madoki La Nina, that's a La Nina sort of, just like El Ninos, they have Madoki El Ninos, and they are like super weak El Ninos, and they don't really have a whole lot of effect on the atmosphere. Wouldn't be surprising if maybe that's what we've got going on here. And then finally, upper ocean heat anomalies for the past year, West Pacific here, East Pacific here. You can see back in October of last year, warm water pushing across the Pacific, the last one, two, three, maybe four uh, uh, pushes of warm water driven by the active phase of the MJO. And then the inactive phase of the MJO sets up, and here's the beginning of our La Nina development. Cold water pushing across once, twice, three times, four times, and our current one, the fifth time here in September. So though we saw only three on the charts, it looks like there's been five easterly wind events that have fed pulses of cold water pushing subsurface. Now, this is all subsurface. This is not at the ocean surface. Uh, so it's like rivers of cold water pushing across the Pacific and then erupting. The axis right here looks somewhere around 110, maybe 100 west, something like that. We'll dig into that a little bit more here. And here we are, sea surface temperature anomalies. So we know there's been a lot of cold water moving around subsurface, but at the ocean surface, well, you can see here is the manifestation of that cold water. And it's only been in about the past two, two and a half weeks, really, that the surface has shown considerable or a reasonable expansion of the cold water pool across from well, from Ecuador over the Galapagos, and now out to the Dateline, Hawaii's up there. You also see lots of warm anomalies. Again, we talked about this some last week. The climatological 30-year average can't keep up with a warming planet. So, of course, it looks like it's baking warm. Uh, and it is. It's a lot warmer than normal. But um, still, this is a clear La Nina signal developing. Let's go look at the past seven days. All right, here's the seven-day trend. You see waters, well, uh, South America, that's Peru, Chile, uh, Chile Peru, uh, Ecuador right there, the equator right along here. Seven days, colder than normal waters building across. So this really looks like the first major La Nina surge uh, or, yeah, the cold, cold water surge on the equator of this La Nina event. Now, this is important because... Just because you get cold water at the surface, cold water at the surface does not support evaporation, right? It, it basically builds high pressure on top of it, which is the hallmark of La Nina, high pressure building over the uh, East Pacific, low pressure building, what will you say, 90 East, so somewhere in this area. 
La Nina. Low pressure here, high pressure here. El Nino is the reverse. High pressure in this area, low pressure over here, supported by the, uh, a warm water erupting off of Ecuador. Now, if it's just now that we're really starting to see both here and on the image we looked up up above, if it's just now that we're starting to see cold water erupt, uh, erupting here, then you're not getting, it takes three months for high pressure to get established. I mean, the, the cold water has to stay in place and be consistent long enough for the atmosphere to respond. It takes about three months. So if we're the end of September, okay, October, November, it'll be Christmas time before any kind of a real La Nina signal starts clearly showing up in the atmosphere. That's my rule of thumb. We'll see how this plays out, but this is pretty much the first time we've seen a clear La Nina signal at the surface, and it appears in the past week to only be building. So we're in the first push of it. Give it three months from now, and that's when we'll start seeing the effects in the atmosphere. Now, also consider that we are coming out of El Nino. It wasn't a super strong El Nino, but it was El Nino nonetheless, and the momentum from that El Nino is still in the atmosphere, still doing its thing. So... Again, I've been saying for quite a while now, I don't think it's going to be till maybe in mid-January till we really start seeing the effects of La Nina in the atmosphere and washing out the effects of last year's El Nino. We'll see. I'm, I'm trying to give myself some hope, but there is another thing going against that, and you know what it is. It's the PDO. We're going to get into that a little bit more later in the discussion. Here's the temperature trend in the Nino 1.2 region. This is the area right there off the Galapagos in Ecuador. Temperatures today, 987 thousandths of a degree below normal, the threshold. Well, it, it, there is no threshold in the Nino 1.2 region, but you get generally see temperatures have been cold and unchanging since May and even before then. There is no clear trend here. But in the Nino 3.4 region, this is the official El Nino region, the area on the equator, five degrees north and south of the equator from a point south of California out to about the dateline. Temperature trend has been normal through July 14th, then slowly fading. The cutoff the, for a weak La Nina is half a degree below normal. So right here, we didn't even start to get a single, we got one reading back here at the beginning of August a couple readings into late August, but it's only in September that we've started to fall consistently down into that range. Today's value minus 1.039 or one degree below normal. So from a half degree to one degree is considered a weak La Nina, and it has to be in that range for effectively three consecutive or five consecutive months, let's say. You know, we're just now starting to move into that threshold again this is the i think it's going to be three months from here till you start seeing the effects of this in the atmosphere assuming it holds just keep that in your mind and we'll dig deeper now back to that three month discussion and what's happening what does the atmosphere think is going on right now well you look at the southern oscillation index the difference in pressure between darwin australia and tahiti tahiti in the pacific darwin uh, over in roughly the Indian Ocean. Both these are more or less on the equator. We have 200 years of data where someone sat there with a barometer and measured pressure day by day by day. So this is a pretty good way of, you know, just Johnny on the spot, eyes on the ground, see what's going on. Today, if pressure is lower over Tahiti, the index goes negative. Well, minus 1.07 is nothing. It's basically neutral. Where have we been on a daily basis? Well, positive, a couple of negatives, a little positives, and before that it was back and forth. So I'd say the balance now is shifting towards positive, but it's been right around hovering around neutral for quite a while now. The 30-day average, a longer running average, four so a 30-day look back, if you will, 4.15, so just barely positive. And where have we been? Well, we were negative, so this also is good at teasing out the active and inactive phase of the MJO because they run in about, oh, three to four week cycles, something like that. So again, 
This guy's hovering right around neutral. And then we go look at the 90-day average. This is your El Nino, La Nina indicator. Today's value, 1.46. Dead neutral, where have we been? Well, we've been negative, so we're we're just officially, let's see, that, that's probably on September 5th, that's when we officially hit dead neutral. And now we're slowly trying to work ourselves into positive territory. But you're not into uh, La Nina territory until this is up at like plus 10 or something like that. So the atmosphere for right now looks to be dead neutral. Here's a 30-day running SOI graphed out. Here is what uh, the uh, Bureau of Meteorology in Australia says is neutral from what was that plus six and a half to minus six and a half? I would say five, but whatever, it's all the same. Here is supposedly our El Nino developing in 2023. It stalled, you know the story, I've talked it before. And then ever since January, we've just been pinging around. The downward pushes are the active phase, the MJO. The upward pushes, the inactive phase. What this suggests is the active phases and the inactive phases have been balancing each other out. And still, even at this moment in time, there's no clear indicator, at least in the atmosphere, that what's happening in the ocean is affecting the atmosphere above it. We're dead neutral. So what's the forecast? Well, we're going to look from at the CFS model uh, for the, Nin the sea surface temperature anomaly forecast for the Nino 3.4 region. Uh, where here is the actual water temperatures confirmed. Uh, last confirmation, half a degree below normal. That would have been right about maybe a week ago. Um, and the forecast has temperatures falling, peaking, bottoming out at maybe 1.1 degrees in December. That would be, so this is from half a degree to one degree is weak La Nina, and one to one and a half degrees is moderate. La Nina, and La Nina is not based on a single point in time, but a, an average, say, over like nearly five months. This whole event would start in, yeah, that's mid-October, so let's say early October, and pretty much wrap up come February, something like that, so October, November, December, January, okay, we'll say five months, and your average temperature would probably be, just eyeballing this, maybe about 0.7 of a degree. Okay, and this is the most extreme version of this model. There's different runs, but at best, a weak La Nina. Here's the other version, the PDF corrected version. It shows temperatures down to only 0.95 of a degree. And again, your, your average temperature may be 0.6 of a degree below normal, so barely weak La Nina. That is a good sign. The models, if anything, are trending upwards, not downwards, in terms of water temperatures. So if your water temperature isn't as cold, you won't be as effective as building high pressure on top of that cold water, and then that will do less to dampen the storm track and the storm systems pushing over the Pacific, theoretically, in winter. And then we have the consensus model. Of every model, all the dynamic models, you see them right here, all the statistic models, Okay, and just eyeballing it, let's see if we can, let's see if I can get the, there we go, well, uh, there we go. The, the, the statistic average at this point in time, and this is peak coldness, minus three, 34 hundredths of a degree, a third of a degree below normal, that's not even weak La Nina. The dynamic model, a bit more aggressive, showing p temperatures dipping out at 0.86 of a degree, uh, a little over three quarters of a degree in, uh, let's say, December time frame. Um, so that is officially a weak La Nina. We can dig in actually much deeper here. Here is all the models, and it's in season, September, October, November, October, November, December. You get the idea. We'll just go right to the, the average of the dynamic models showing peak temperatures, 862 thousandths of a degree below normal in the December time frame. Okay, and then heading up from there and quickly rebound, rebounding to neutral. Statistic models suggest, oh, minus 339 thousandths of a degree, a third of a degree, and what's that in January? Yeah, January. Okay, you average all of it together, it shows half a degree, 656 thousandths of a degree below normal, so bare minimum 
active uh, or um, uh, bare minimum La Nina uh, for this winter. That is very good news. And every time this model runs, it seems like the temperatures go up a little more and a little more. So, again, we were looking back, looking at, well, when there's one more big inactive phase forecast starting, was it, you know, somewhere in October, maybe that will be it and this will all be over. But we still have to contend with the PDO, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, okay? We have three different waves that are interacting. These are oscillations, really, if you want to talk about it. We have the MJO, which is sort of a four weeks on, four weeks off sort of thing. And then you have the El Nino-La Nina oscillation, which is, are the inactive phases of the MJO in preponderance or in the majority? That drives us to La Nina. If the active phases are in preponderance, that drives us into El Nino. And then on top of all that, you have the PDO, which says, is the atmosphere biased cold like this region, this time period here? And this was a long run from May 1998, the whole way through to, well, I think it's still going on. These are little El, El Nino events, but as of right now, still going on and still pretty negative. So the atmosphere for the past, I don't know, 25 years has been biased cold. If you start throwing inactive phases of the MJO and or La Nina events on top of that, it only reinforces that cold pattern. And then likewise, prior to uh, March of 98, it was the opposite. The atmosphere was biased warm or the oceans were biased warm. And then when you threw El Nino on top of it, it only amplified it and the El Ninos went nuts. So we've been in a long running hole here. La Nina, I think, and the cold PDO, actually, this cold PDO significantly influenced last year's El Nino and took, like, stole some of the energy from it, took the legs out of it. And now we're in a La Nina pattern, and the PDO is likely enhancing that. The fact that the, uh, that the uh, uh, La Nina pattern isn't forecast to get that, get that strong really suggests that maybe... And I even hate to say it, but maybe we're starting to run towards the end. Maybe this cold run or this long running cold PDO is started to reach the end of its run. It normally runs 25 to 30 years. So we'll see. I'm not going to dig any deeper than that tonight. But maybe, just maybe, this will be a short run, run La Nina event and then we'll be off to something better. All right, so to wrap it up real quick, for the Pacific, looks like there is swell on the way for Hawaii and California, north of Point Conception. There is actually a little gale forecast off of New Zealand, so maybe a little pulse of southern hemming energy for Hawaii and into southern California beyond that. And the North Pacific, though nothing solid is indicated, it seems like there is hope for swell beyond. I mean, we are getting deeper into fall. The other thing is the seasons. Yeah, why is it taking so long for fall to get going? Well, I think there is, again, like I said before, this predisposition predis of the PDO and a La Nina-like pattern sort of blocking the atmosphere, stealing some of its momentum. It doesn't have any push one way or the other. This coming La Nina doesn't look to be a strong La Nina, and that'll only sort of reinforce this just the The pendulum isn't swinging one way or the other. It's pretty much sitting where it's been, and I sus expect that's going to happen for a bit longer. So I don't have high hopes for this winter. In fact, in the, on the Pacific forecast, I updated the winter outlook for the North Pacific. I think I gave it out of a 1 to 10 scale, 10 being off the charts for surf production and 1 being like horrible. I think I gave it a 3.5 or a 4, something like that. So just given, given that there is this blocking pattern in the atmosphere, um, that said, if La Nina isn't too strong, I'd rather have that than some raging La Nina and us go back into the hole and go into another three years of La Nina. I'm just hoping that this is all over. Uh, other than that, precip-wise for California, well, we'll see. Maybe we'll get lucky and get 85% of normal precip, or maybe not. Hard to say. The models, 
But so again, like the hurricane models were were raging about how how great it was going to be in the Atlantic this past summer in terms of hurricane production. It's been a total dud. That's because I think La Nina hasn't developed as as expected, and I think that's been stealing the energy from the hurricanes. But the ones that do form pretty strong, but they're all kind of on the edges, like in the Gulf of Mexico or off somewhere. That's classic kind of a a La Nina summer setup. I mean, I'm sorry, an El Nino influence set up in, for the summer in Hurricane Alley in the Atlantic. Um, that said, there wasn't a, hur- a whole lot of hurricanes in the Pacific either. Maybe, you know, so that, that's speaking to La Nina. Again, this sort of this mixed signal, I think it's all driven by the cold phase of the PDO. So we'll see how things work out long term. But there is some surf coming. Better make the most of it while you can. And hopefully there'll be more behind it. All right, that's our video for this week. If you enjoyed it, give us a thumbs up. If you hadn't subscribed, subscribe below. Kick the storm surf icon in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. If you have questions or comments, write them up down below. We always appreciate it and it does help the algorithm. And if you'd like to make a small contribution to you, the cause, you may. Hit the super thanks button down below, the heart with the dollar sign in it. With that, we're done for this week. We'll do it again next week. Same time, same channel. Thanks so much for watching.